J.T. Pardee, U.S. Geological Survey, looked at the same stuff we're seeing here back in the 1920s and 1930s. And he calculated that the, using hydrological formulas, he calculated that the volume of water passing through this valley was nine and one-half cubic miles every hour. <laughs> nine and one-half cubic miles per hour passing through this valley and every hour. So now, look at that rock face. See, a rock doesn't just end up looking like that by some normal process. What we're seeing there is the aftermath of an extremely turbulent, forceful, violent flow of water that once passed over these rocks and scoured their face like this. And uh, what I was thinking was we'd all get canoes and we'd go down this Clark Fork in canoes. Can I bring my fishing pole? Yeah. Sure. We'll cook it. What I'm doing is putting this together to try to quickly and simply convey to somebody who does has never heard or knows anything even at all about catastrophism or diluvialism or any of that, which is the vast majority, about 99.999% of the human population has not a clue that we actually live on a planet that is periodically undergoes global catastrophes. And the second thing they don't realize is that what we now know about the timing and tempo of these global catastrophes and the intervals between successive catastrophes is this. As we look at the last quarter million years, and this is a fact that you should really, really ingrain into your consciousness, is this. In the last quarter million years, the longest interval between catastrophes is the one we're in now. <clears throat> we have gone, we're now in a record. We've set a record for having gone 10,000 years without a global catastrophe of the scale that we're seeing here. Well, actually, if it turns out that the Burkle Crater that we've talked about in here is authentic, which it certainly suggests that it was, then we actually had a global catastrophe 6,000 years ago. However, it wasn't as severe as this one. And what do we use as the barometer for severity of catastrophes? Loss of life. Loss of life, exactly, Dolores, exactly. So when this event happened, there was a major species loss all over the planet with a few very significant exceptions. One of those exceptions being Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, when, you go, when one goes in, like to early, the work of early anthropologists, early part of the 20th century, where anthropologists are collecting tales, and there was a number of them, for example, that were interested in um, the unity of ancient mythic traditions. And so they collected tales, for example, um, the belief in giants. Many, many, you know, <coughs> indigenous peoples have tales about giants. Okay. Well, the Bible talks about giants. And it, but the Bible talks about giants. Um, also, many traditions have belief uh, that human beings once had a longer lifespan. But of all of the traditions and their universality, the most prevalent one found amongst the greatest majority of cultures the world over is that of a great flood. I mean, far and away, that's the one that is most consistently reported in a whole variety of ancient traditions, the Great Flood. So, what we've got here is that there was, what you're looking at right here is graphic evidence of a Great Flood. Now, the point that I keep trying to make here is that academic, the main, academic mainstream has contrived a theory for this that keeps its significance limited to a strictly local or regional event. And what I'm saying, and have been for 20 years, is that no, this is actually evidence of a global catastrophe that, sh that manifested its effects regionally, and the way it manifested its effects in the southern Appalachians wasn't the same as it manifested its effects in Pacific Northwest, or how it manifested its effects you know, in the Mediterranean, or in South America, or in, in Europe, or any other place. But the catastrophe was pretty much global in scale, and it had varying degrees of severity depending on geographic location. North America and South America were the most severely affected by the last great global catastrophe, as would be evidenced by the sheer number of species lost. 
And South America actually, in my latest research, I've discovered that now the census is that South America actually lost more mega mammals than North America. Mm -hmm. More <laughs> mega mammals. So, was there, yes? Was the ice, there wasn't ice down there. There was not ice down there, no, there wasn't. But so, what it, whatever triggered the catastrophe, it was able to cause a mass extermination in South America, but it also apparently was able to trigger the melting of the ice. Because, see, that is one of the unexplained mysteries of science currently, is where the energy source to melt the ice. It melted too fast. That's the problem. I, we've talked about that repeatedly in here, the energy paradox. Okay, so at the end of the last ice age, the planet lost half of its great mammals. Half. That was a significant loss. Okay, you've seen this. I'm going to go real quick. High water mark, pretty obvious, right? Strand lines, see the faint horizontal lines left over from the water draining away, just like we see on the mountainsides out in western United States. Can you see them? Yeah. They're visible, right? You see them, don't you, Whit? I see them on you the white. On the white, not the blue. Let's see. Yeah, I can't see them on the blue, but you can see them on the white. Yeah. yeah. Okay, gravel bar, um, hummocky ripples. This happens when the water is too turbulent to build, um, to build nice symmetrical ripples. Again, hummocky ripples. And what I'm going to do is speed through here. Here's a... Um, a sandbar newly created by a flood, a small flood. You can see the scale there. Is that a pin? Uh, no, I think that's, um, isn't that one of the tanks from the space shuttle? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's a pin. Okay, that's a pin. I thought. <clears throat> now, who remembers what this is called without reading the caption? Okay, go ahead and read the caption. What's the imbrication? Somebody tell me what the imbrication is. Well, there's lots of Middle-sized rocks. Well, the stacking stacking. of the rocks. You see the stacking of the rocks? Mm -hmm. that kind of like here. Let me use this. Let me use these videos to show you. Here's a perfect. Here we go. There's the imbrication. See it? Now, if the current flowed the other direction, it would do this, and your imbrication mm -hmm. would be this way. This this stacking of the rocks in this very peculiar fashion, like this is definitely very uh, prominently and unambiguously an indicator of current flow. This was after, uh, oh, after a big rain up in the North Georgia mountains next to a creek. Sorry about the blurriness, but you can see the stacking. You see, look at here, you see the stacking? That's what's called imbrication. I am. I am. Imbrication, just like the word right there. You know where that's taken? Uh, well, Blue Ridge area of North Georgia. Yeah, actually, I remember where it is. It's a, uh, I can't remember the name of the creek right off the top of my head. But it was about three or four years ago. My guess is that those rocks probably aren't like that anymore. Why, were you going to go up and look for it? Oh, you like nice rocks, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty rock. Pretty, yeah. pretty blue rock. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, what are we looking at here? Do I see some imbrication? Let me see. What does it say? Oh, more imbrication. Which way was the current flow? To the left. To the left. Well, let's just see. You're right. It was to the left. Cell phone gives you a... See, now this is, this is what we're talking about where you put something in the picture for scale. Right? A glow-in-the-dark cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> Aha, which way was current flow? Right. To the right. God, you guys are good. Ah, huh, there we are. You were right. We're You're passing the test. You're gonna, I'm going to have to confer geological degrees upon you. Okay, which way was current flow? Right. Going to the right, wasn't it? Okay, and you notice this current flow is getting a little bit more substantial. I like that hat better. Mm -hmm. Current flow. How about this? Which direction is current flow? From above. Hard to tell because Jesse's moving the rock. <laughs> <laughs> From right to left. Okay. 
How about this one? Which way was current flow? Right to left. Right. Yes. Right. Now, right. if before I move on, I want you to ponder. Now, what kind of a current flow are we talking about mm. here? <laughs> Big one right there. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we're probably talking about a current flow that's several hundred feet deep. We're probably talking about a peak discharge that's the size of a, of a major river passing through this valley, and this is up in the Smokies. This is by Big Creek, which is up in the Smoky Mountain National Park. And if you hike over the Smokies and get off away from the roadways, you'll see stuff like this all over the darn place. And once you, for example, know what imbrication is, you know, your average uninformed person will walk up here and go by this and maybe be impressed by the size of these rocks, but have no clue as to what it's really the story they're telling. See, but what this is, this is, a, this is telling a story about unimaginably large-scale floods passing through these mountain hollows. If you look at the size of the tree, Trees are not that big. They're young trees. Yeah, so they're so, young trees. So, so if you had that happening, they were, those trees would not be there. No, those trees would not be there. And you can see that you know the trees have grown up in between the rocks, mm -hmm. so the rocks haven't really moved. And my guess is that this was probably logged over in the early part of the 20th century. I think a lot of it was. Small gravel bar. Gravel bar. Ah, here we go. Beautiful example of scale and variance. Look at there. You see the delta fan? Mm. Right there? Looks just like the Nile River, doesn't it? If you look at air NASA photographs of the mouth of the Nile, it looks just like this. In fact, what we see is multiple delta fans here splay, splaying out, splaying out. Because see, what we had here was a, we had a major sandbar formed by a flood, and then residual flood waters cut this secondary channel into the newly created uh, sandbar, and then built these beautiful little deltas. Look at this. Now, <clears throat> in here are a whole hodgepodge, and I won't try to explain, of landforms. This hummocky is formed by when water is very turbulent. When you see the current ripples with nice parallel parallelism, that indicates that the current flow is more uniform. As it transitions into turbulence, the current ripples become more hummocky, like this. Notice this newly eroded cliff face right here. Okay, every one of these features we're going to see on a large scale. Do you see shorelines mm -hmm. from this dried up lake? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can read this here. Now, if you look, this is, a, this is a really beautiful example of scale invariance. Notice you've got this small little creek. On the outside of the bend, it's got a steeper bank, and on the inside of the bend, it's building this little sandbar. Well, when you look at the big picture, you see here's the outside of a bend, here's the, here's the sandbar, the opposite side is cut steep. So what you're seeing here is, is you're just seeing if you take this and just size it up, there's an example of scale invariance. Water really has this property in that it can erode stuff on a small scale that's identical in shape and form to what it does on a large scale. So if you want to learn how to read the effects of these giant catastrophic floods, start by just going out by our local creeks after it rains and studying what you see. Pardon me? No, this is South Fork of the Peachtree Creek. Now you see here how it's steep on this side and it's building a sandbar on this side. Now interestingly, what you have here is a remnant 
See, this, this is the equivalent of a flood plain. Now, the ancient giant floods, this whole area for about a mile wide is a giant flood plain <clears throat> that was left over when this whole thing was like a river moving through here. And then as the river drained away, it left this flat flood plain, and the modern creek has cut down this little channel in it where it's been flowing for, say, the last 10,000 years. Oblique ripples along the flank of a stream-cut channel in a gravel bar. You see those ripples? How they're actually on the side of this slope here? Now, you can find that exact thing duplicated right here, mm -hmm. but on a much larger scale. Do you remember this, Bill? Mm -hmm. You've been here, Bill. Yep. This is, uh... Is this Copper Hill? Where are you? No, this is out in, uh... This is Washington State. This is um, um, McNeil Canyon. McNeil, yeah. Remember that? Was, that? That whole canyon was incredible. Okay, how about this canyon? Now oh, notice man. here, scale and variance. Mm -hmm. Here you have the little channel cut in the freshly made sandbar, and here you have the catastrophic flood channel. We're looking upstream, and you can see same kind of dog leg. You see how the dog legs like this, mm -hmm. just like, uh, just yeah. like this. Where was that one? This is um, this is in Idaho. This is in southern yeah. Idaho. This mm -hmm. is near the Snake River. Oh. In fact, this oh, right up just off the slide is the Snake River Canyon up here, and this thing opens into it. Mallet Gorge. Mallet Gorge. Mallet Gorge. I gotta, Gorge. I gotta look at that on the satellite map. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. And you can see the road down here yeah. for scale. That well, there, there are the points of the chevrons. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where's that? This is in uh, Madagascar. Madagascar. Mm -hmm. Are those the uh, ones? You been there? Not yet. Are those the ones associated with the Next weekend, though. Are those those 600 high? Six those are 600 foot high, 600 foot thick chevrons. Those so are the ones associated with vertical crater. Yes. Yes. The, the hill is a deposition of the gravel or the hill? The hill is composed of material that was dredged up off the ocean floor from 12,000 feet down. So the ocean came in this way? The ocean came <laughs> in. The ocean came in from the right washing a lot of material up, and then as it flowed back out, it created the chevrons pointing in the direction that the water drained back off. So this is on the island of Madagascar? Yes. So well, here I've got, your, that field right there is three miles wide. And that, that cross section is fairly close to the photograph we just looked at. Hmm. What's the white? Um, that's probably a sand deposit. Probably like big sand dunes that have been left over. And here's more. This is Australia. And what you're seeing here is evidence of tsunamis, giant tsunamis that have come in and traveled 10 to 20 miles <coughs> inland and left these huge deposits on land. These, these deposits here are probably the counterpart See, this is the southern part of Australia, Madagascar's up on the other side of the Indian Ocean. These are probably the counterpart. And they're probably related to the Burkle Crater impact event. It was in the Indian Ocean. It was in the Indian Ocean. And probably was responsible for the legends of, the, of Noah's Flood. Okay, what are we looking at here? Looks like deltas. See fan deltas? Mm -hmm. Ah, there they are. Look at there. Fan deltas. There they're these beautifully formed fan deltas. That's why we wear a hat. <laughs> and then we see a fan delta oh, in Death Valley. At Mormon Point, anybody been in Death Valley? Yeah. Did you go by? Do you remember if you went by Mormon Point? Oh, let's see. Is that you? I think that's you there, isn't it? 
in places. <laughs> All right, take a look. Okay, let's decipher this. We see hills. We see obviously there's a, ch a connection between this channel and this outflow here, right? Yeah. Clearly, clearly this material okay. must have been part once up here and then eroded out. Now, as we look further, we see shorelines. See the shorelines? And we see that the shorelines are cut by these gullies, and it also looks like the shoreline is cut by this big channel here. Now, let's look further, and notice here, we've got a little smaller fan forming right here, don't we? And it's sort of a smaller version of this, which is a larger fan. And then we see that we have this shorelines up here, which are almost, almost a thousand feet up off the floor of Death Valley. How come there's not shorelines on the opposite side of the gouge in the middle that would match the other side? Well, it looks like there's been a lot of erosion over there okay. and slumping. So if there's erosion and slumping and so forth, that's going to obscure. Really, when you look in Death Valley, all you have is selective preservations of the shorelines. But to somebody who knows how to read them, they're pretty, pretty evident. Now, which was first, the shorelines or that gully? Shorelines. Shorelines, shorelines for first, because they're cut by the gully. Exactly. Which was first, this big fan or the little fan? The big one, the big one obviously, right? Now, <clears throat> The Holocene is the last 10,000 years of more or less normal, what we think of as familiar earth change. This fan has been created, this is the Holocene fan, right here. This is probably repeated events, perhaps larger than the one that created this, flash flood events that would have washed this material out and spread it into the form of this fan. Okay, now, in order, I said this isn't finished yet, but when it's finished, I will have aerial views of this whole scene so that you can see that, well, if you look at this, look, let's look at the little fan for some scale and variant lessons. Do you see that in the little fan, it's incised by these marginal gullies, right? They're, they're, sh they're small gullies. They're small gullies, but you can see how the fan, the low bake fan is incised by those gullies. So what you had is the fan was created, and then more water flowed over this newly deposited fan and cut new gullies into the new fan, right? Well, here's what you got to realize, is that this is a fan, and it stands in relation to this fan, but this fan is just a small fan compared to what this was. This is actually a gigantic delta fan right here. And just as there are small gullies cut in the perimeter of this, there are large gullies cut in the perimeter of this. The sequence of events here was you had a massive inflow of water into Death Valley, washing material in and creating submarine deltas. The water rose up to this height and then slowly evaporated away because Death Valley has no outlet to the sea. It's an inland basin. So once it filled up, the water had no place to go. All it could do was slowly evaporate away, which it did, leaving behind this mineral deposit, this saline layer that you see here that's all this white stuff that's been buried. See, if you were able to sweep this delta fan away, you'd see this white stuff under it, which is salt and minerals from the water having drained away, evaporated away slowly. So what you got a picture here is you've got various scales of events superimposed upon each other. You have a little, this is probably some from a flash flood, say within the last 10 or 20 years. This is from a series of larger flash floods that have occurred during the last 10,000 years. And this is the fan created by the gigantic floods at the end of the last ice age that washed this stuff in, filled it up to here, then the water drained off, and only after the water drained off was it possible to start cutting these gullies into it. When they're underwater, they're not going to be cutting gullies, are they? It's when the water goes down 
that now you can start cutting gullies. And we have walked, we actually hiked up into this gully here, and you can study the strata, the material that's composed in these. Because when it first dawned on me that that's what we were looking at, I, was, I had doubts. I said, it's not possible, is it? So what we need to do is go and take a closer look at the material comprising that. And sure enough, it was all, it was all gravelly, unconsolidated sediments, which was the proof. <clears throat> is the white stuff, um, was it there bef before the, me the very first flood? No. How, 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 did, how did it, is it level? Yes. Salty? Salty level, and it's when you actually you can't tell from this perspective, but when you're down on it, it's very, very rugged. It's it's like there are salt crystals that are like several feet big. You could, I mean, it would probably kill you to try to walk across it. I walked out into some of it, and uh, it was just it was nasty. Nasty because what? Well, because it's like you're walking over these giant, sharp, jagged. Has crystals it, of salt and minerals. Yeah, has it, um, like when mud dries up, did it, has it got big gaps between uh, the in Desiccation the cracks, that's called. Big cracks. Yeah, I think, I don't remember yeah. desiccation cracks specifically. But how did it get to be salty? From the water. Well, what you had was you had water draining from thousands of square miles around the southwest water draining across, washing across the Mojave Desert, draining into Death Valley because Death Valley is this low point. So what you had was the minerals contained in the water probably washed right out of the rock. When you go down to the bottom of this, see what you got at the bottom of this is hundreds and hundreds of feet thick of sediment. Death Valley is like this structural trough. And it's got at least a thousand, maybe several thousand feet of sediment filling the bottom of the trough, right? Now that was probably washed in as a result of repeated floods over hundreds of thousands of years, with the last great one being the one that left those shorelines. But you had a flood that filled up from the existing valley floor up to the upper shoreline is almost a thousand feet. So now you've got this body of standing water that has no place to go. So what it does is over the next probably couple of millennium, as the climate changed, because during the Ice Age, remember, this was a lush, fertile grassland with interspersed forests. Now it's a desert. So accompanying the end of the Ice Age, there was also tremendous climate changes. So we had a shift from this more temperate climate to this arid climate that it is now. Okay, so now you've got this body of water sitting in this, just filling this trough that has no outlet. So it just sits there, and now because, the, because of the diminution, diminishment of the rainfall, it's not being replenished. So it just slowly evaporates away, and as it evaporates away, the mineral content gets left behind. And so as the water level goes down, the mineral content and salt content is increasing until it's finally you've just got this, this is like a, 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 a vape, evaporites it's called. So when you have a, a lot of material in the water and the water just evaporates away, this is like the scum that's left over on your bathtub. Well, you say like the salt you, is uh, sodium chloride or is it some other kind of salt? It's sodium chloride salt. Which would indicate it's from the ocean Maybe. And you were saying it was from the rocks. Well, it could be from either one or both. But, see, when you say ocean, that raises an interesting question. Because how do you get the ocean water here? Well, yeah, that's what I'm driving at. So I figured that's what you were getting at. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that from the Oh, I don't know. Hundreds of miles. You know, it's you know, it, it, it sits right on the border of California and Nevada. Okay. So you got to cross the whole state of Southern California. Yeah, What's how wide? Five hundred, six hundred miles. Three hundred miles. Three hundred miles. Yeah. Yeah. miles? Yeah. So, so you're so you're saying what caused those came from the ocean and not from. The I'm north? not saying that. Oh, okay. Charles was asking. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So this must come from the north then. Well, I'm not saying that either. Ooh. 
But I can tell you where, where a lot of the water came from because me and Brad have actually gone and driven hundreds of miles across the Mojave Desert tracing the path of floodwaters from Southern California right into Death Valley. Now, you saw pictures of gravel bars next to the creek. Well, here's a gravel bar. It's the mouth of this thing right here. This is Moses Cooley. Here's a gravel bar that's 500, that's five miles long and probably 500 feet thick. And what do they have to do to the soils to make such beautiful farms? Beautiful farms? Irrigation. Irrigation. <laughs> that's it. But, but if it's all gravel, you still, I mean... Well, see, here's the thing. After the floods were over, the silt. there was a frosting of lust deposited over everything. This mysterious material called lust which happens to be very fertile, very fertile stuff. And so you had this layer of lust deposited all over these hills after the last flood. In some cases, the lust is six feet thick. Well, why, so, is, why is it mysterious? Why is it mysterious? Yeah. Where did it come from? Well, that's part of why it's mysterious. Where did it come <laughs> from? And it has peculiar characteristics that in some ways makes it look water deposited, but in other ways makes it look like it's wind deposited. And geologists have been arguing for over a century whether it's wind deposited or water deposited. And I say it's not a matter of either or. What about both? Yeah. It's a matter of both, as Elizabeth so astutely observes. Spell that, Randall? L-O-E-S-S. L-O-E-S-S. And I will talk about that one evening. Is that the same as topsoil? Well, it is. It forms topsoil. But see, now out here in this semi-arid climate with 15 to 18 inches of rainfall per year, it doesn't do much. But as soon as you put a little bit of water on it, it turns into that green stuff right there. Yeah. That's really all you got to do. Put a little bit of water on it, and it just comes to life. And what do they grow? Powdery. What is that? Uh, what, what is, is that? that area That's probably orchards. Yeah, it looks like fruit trees. I think it's fruit trees. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, Brad? Apples. Here. A lot of it, they grow a lot of apples here for yeah. sure. <coughs> yeah, I can't remember right there. A lot of apples, a lot of wheat. You're in what? Where are you now? This is that's the Columbia River right there. <coughs> so we are in Washington, Eastern Washington mm -hmm. State. Tatus. Beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. It mm. is gorgeous. Oh, this is just magnificent. Okay. Where are the, where are the flat salt <laughs> plains they use for racing and? That's Bonneville. That's Lake Bonneville. Why is it not uh, cracked and all? Why is it? Why did it? Um, why are there no desiccation cracks? Right. Why is it so smooth? My guess is it has probably to do with the nature of the salt. You know, because what happens is with clay, clay swells when it gets wet. Right. I don't think salt does. Clay swells when it wet gets wet. So when it dries out, it shrinks, which causes it to crack. Okay. What's that? Uh, Landing base for shuttles out in Southern California. Vandenberg, Edwards, Air Force. Edwards. Oh, right. Near Palmdale, California. That's real it's, flat, right? It's the Mojave right. Desert. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty close to that. Okay, what I want you to do here is notice the terrace. You have a flat top thing with a steep bank next to the water. And this is again South Fork of Peachtree Creek. And then we see this, same, same deal. Now this gives you an idea. This is the Columbia River down here. That's Chelan. Yeah. Did you say that? Chelan? Have you been there? I lived out in Seattle for Well, 10 then years. you know this so area know this well. Yes, area. this is taken from Chelan Butte, this yeah. picture. Chelan Butte. That's where this picture is taken. And you're looking across, you're looking east here. Across, this is the Waterville Plateau out here. And uh, what we see here are these giant terraces. And to picture how a terrace is built, I should have, I need to make a graphic of this, but you've got a trough picture and you've got this sediment laden water moving through it. And then the water declines and it mantles the bottom of your valley with this flat layer of sediment. Okay, now that's the flood. The flood goes away and then you have residual flows that are transitioning between the giant flood flows and the modern water flow. And in that transition, it cuts down 
into the flat, soft terrace materials that has been left by the flood. And that's what you're seeing here. So when you travel up to Columbia, there are many places where you see these terraces are like shelves on both sides of the river. And that's a sure indication that there was once a huge flow of water through here. And in fact, all of this erosion is because this was temporarily an inland sea up here that drained over these hills down into the Columbia Valley, filled it with hundreds of feet thick of sediment. So each of these things is an indicator, if you learn to read them, each of these things is an indicator of these giant catastrophic floods. And the golf course. Yeah. <laughs> and here we're looking at, from six feet up, we're looking at a gravel bar with hummocky uh, features and exposed gravel. And here you see the same thing, but the difference is this is 2,000 feet up, and the larger pebbles here are the size of Sam's house. Mm -hmm. This is the outwash, the creation of a, of a coulee, Grand Coulee. Now what's interesting about this is you've got two types of rock. You've got basalt rock that's locally derived from just north of here. Then you also have pink granite that's come out of the Canadian Rockies. In other words, this, these rocks here, these rocks here traveled anywhere from 5 to 50 miles. Mm -hmm. These rocks may have traveled up to 500 miles or more from their place of origin. So explaining how they got there is an interesting task. This is about 50 to 60 miles south of where the glaciers were, 50 miles, say. So somehow they then got transported beyond and most likely, you know, carried in the floodwaters. Could they have been bound up in some ice that floated? Yes, they certainly could have. They certainly could have. In fact, many of the large erratics that we see out here, that's exactly how they got there, is floated in icebergs. Now here we're seeing this kind of hummocky, it's also called lemniscape, where you get these kind of nice scalloped formations in the sand. You see that? See how they're kind of rounded? This is what's referred to as the lemniscate or the scalloped effect. You have almost like a little pothole there and you see the roundness there and how these forms are. Well, here you see the same thing. Wow. But obviously on a much, you know, we're looking at a field of these formations that's about 10 miles wide. And where is that? This is also in Washington State. In fact, this is created this is south of and created by the same water flow that created this. What's the uh, what's on either side of that? Like, what is the the terrain features? Is it uh, form a channel? Yeah. Well, actually, if you look over here, you can see sort of a channel wall right there. See, there's the edge of this thing. So it was like a ten mile wide river that flowed through here. I, I have some personal experience with floods. Go, oh, go to that picture you're just about to. Yeah, you showed this one before, I think. You see how yeah. the, the landscape features are actually lower than the Here. delta fan on top of that? Yes. I, I think that the turbulent flow was probably caused when the water was receding back into the channel. You have all I'll buy that. different streams coming back in. and they, I they, will certainly. OK, now. You see the hummocky stuff we were talking about here? Look at this, the rounded, kind of hill-like hummocky. Okay, on the large scale, same thing. Hmm. Look at this. Okay, so now first go back. You're looking at this right here, but scaled up, you know, millions of times bigger. Millions of times bigger. And where is that? Is it this Idaho? is southeastern Washington state. This is in the fall. If this was about six weeks earlier, this would have all been green. Let's see, I may have, let's see, yeah, like that. This gives you an idea of how fertile it is. This is all, this is lus. Everything you see here is lay under this layer of lus. <clears throat> And you just put a little bit of water into lust, and boom, it just springs to life. 
But uh, there is some very interesting qualities and characteristics of lust that make it worth exploring further. See, look here. Here you see that sort of lemn escape form right there. See it? What we're seeing here is a water-formed landscape. This is a landscape, though, where the water flow was not great enough to wash away the soil because it wasn't moving fast enough. But it was great enough to move along and create these, these rounded, hillocky forms. That's probably wheat. Yeah. We're up on top of a mountain here called Steptoe Butte. The turf industry has moved out there. Yeah, but this is not turf. That's actually, those are wheat fields. Most of this stuff is wheat. Not up in the hill where we're taking the picture from, but down here in the lowlands, it's wheat. This is by the Columbia, and here you see an example. See, this is flat enough that that's a, uh, didn't we decide that that's an airport there? Yeah. 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 See, see, this out here is a landing strip. It's flat enough. Now, if you look at this one, this knob here, that knob is, you know, hundreds of feet high, but that knob has been scoured by the flood waters that probably rose to about this level through here. And there's a giant gravel bar for you. And there's a house down there to give you some scale. <laughs> hmm. the bar That's a magnificent structure right there. Where is that? That's along the Columbia. It's called West Bar. And it's just a gigantic gravel bar, five miles long, is it, Brad? I think that's about right, isn't it? Three, three to five, yeah. Three, three to five in there, yeah. It's, and it's near Wenatchee, south of Wenatchee. The, you, have you seen this? This was a sandbar that was created by a flood that was probably estimated at about three to four hundred million cubic feet per second. Per second? Per second. But you got to bear in mind, Charles, since 12,000 years ago when this thing was built, nothing has disturbed it. It's remained immovable. I see so many people out there. 